Welcome to Be Kind Connects. I'm your host, Shabnam Islam. And on today's episode, we have vegan strongman Patrick Baboumian. Now, breaking world records and being a champion is nothing new for Patrick. With a resume that highlights a list of German, champ German championship records that span over a decade, that includes both bodybuilding and strongman competitions. Patrick is known for being Germany's strongest man in 2011. He's a 2012 Guinness World Record holder for the beer keg lifting and the 20 kg front hold. That's correct. And the 2013 and 2015 World Record holder for the yoke walk. Sheesh. That's a lot of things. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was busy <laughs> in those years. <laughs> but. That's right. But for most of us, it was the 2018 documentary, The Game Changers, that made Patrick Baboumian a household name. And what an honor it is to have you on our show today. Patrick, thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you so much for having me. So let's talk about you a little bit. Your interest in fitness started at a really early age, and it really didn't begin with strongman competitions. So what inspired you to go into fitness? And frankly, who was your idol back then? Yeah, so I think if you want to really go to the roots of the whole thing, um, you can trace it back to when I was four years old. Um, and my um, that means my, my father was still alive. So I lost my dad around the age of four. So um, that's like one of the last memories that I have from him is uh, he and my mom, uh, they used to watch um the tv series the incredible hulk with lou ferrigno um and that was my first yes. contact with bodybuilding or with, with you know what bodybuilding does to the human physique and uh and because i was four years old i was of course every time he would transform i would be terrified so i would be screaming underneath the <laughs> I, I guess you could say I'm I'm traumatized that way <laughs> from from watching <laughs> from watching a TV series with Lou, um, and I think yeah that that was basically the first time, and that's when the fascination for strength and for superheroes and you know all those concepts basically just just started, and then I, I later I became a um, comic book fan, and I became a fan of you know I was watching all the animated series with uh, the Marvel characters, X Men, and and whatever, and um, and I grew up that way um, until I was fourteen, and that's when I started then to seriously think about uh, actually giving the sport of bodybuilding and and uh, um, um, strength sports in general a go and. And try to see uh, what I could uh, accomplish. Um, and I started with, uh, with um, a little bit of bodybuilding and um, also uh, powerlifting, uh, just because I was. Um, I reckoned that that would be something I, I would have a better chance with the kind of physique that I have because I'm not very tall, um, but um, I was always pretty pretty strong basically compared to my peers. So. Uh, I thought, well, if, if well, that's perfect. That's perfect for bodybuilding yeah. and for for powerlifting exactly. right Perfect. because powerlifting you have three three main lifts the bench the squat and the deadlift yeah. so significantly different than bodybuilding which is seven different poses i think that you have to yeah and on. i think in bodybuilding i i always say um the, the actual sport is not what you do on stage the actual sport is what you do in the gym on stage it is basically a beauty pageant it's like you know i that's what i call it i i don't take it really seriously as a sport when it comes to the part on the stage i mean for me for me it was always great to kind of have this you know have this uh, stage time to present what you've built in the gym so that was all that was um, you know and, and i always liked posing uh, it came pretty easy to me so when when it's the posing round where you can you know um have a, have a free uh, kind of uh, posing routine or something that that you come up with yourself. Uh, I always enjoyed that. Uh, mostly, I would <laughs> I would my, make my pose, uh, posing routine like one night before the show <laughs> because because I would oh just God. you know freestyle something and then um, uh, find a music that fits. So um, yeah, so that's um, uh, that's for bodybuilding, uh, but uh, with every other, like strongman and powerlifting, the actual competition is when you go and you know you, you try to beat um, the other competitors. In in bodybuilding, it is yeah, that's the, your peak your peak performance, yeah. right? And, and specifically, are those, are those comps? it's it's also like these other sports, they are very objective. So either you are stronger than the other guy or you're not. 
But in bodybuilding, it's very subjective. So the actual competition itself, well, there there are just some people who judge, you know, who looks the best. So um, I, I never liked that part of the uh, of the whole thing. I, I always enjoyed the part that is in the gym and where it's specifically for me, uh, the, the greatest part is always to challenge yourself physically. Um, and then when you basically reach your goals and when you when you um, you know beat your um, your own body again and again, it just gives you this sense of power and and uh, empowerment because you 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 know you learn that you can take control over what happens with your body. And I think that's something that um, has a lot of value for you know for other things as well, not only for muscle building. And for those people that don't know, strongman competitions are the ultimate test of strength, endurance, agility, and and mental toughness. Mm -hmm. And we're talking about partaking in 14 different events over the course of five days. Um, And that's things like Farmer's Walk, Atlas Walk, Fridge Walk, uh, Hercules Hold, even this thing called Fingles Fingers, I think. Um, Squat Lift. So out of all of those. Mm -hmm. Which one of those was your most loved and which one was your most hated and why? <laughs> yeah, usually uh, you love the things that you're good at. Um, and, you know, we, we all have have a natural and, and genetic uh, makeup that uh, predestines us for certain, you know, for certain things. And for me, being um, uh, a shorter guy, um, it was always um, – Overhead events, so everything when 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 it comes to lifting something overhead, that that came pretty easy to me. So, one of my favorites was the lock lift, where as a um, um, I, I, when I started um, competing, I started as a as a lightweight. So when I was a lightweight, I actually had a world record in in, in the lock lift as well. So um, so that was basically my 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 favorite over the the course of of most of those years. Uh, but then in the end, when I did uh, um, the Yoke world record, that that is actually in the Game Changers documentary as well. Um, I think that was, for me, like, that's one of the biggest things or, or one of the milestones that I am mo- uh, most fond of remembering because um, there was a lot of pressure uh, beforehand. Um, I actually did a test run in Berlin and that went well. And then the idea was a week later to go to Toronto and, um, you know, repeat the record there, then officially for, for Guinness. Um, and the, the, the equipment was completely new. So, so it was um, some, some other guys' equipment uh, that they got from Canada. It was basically a Canadian uh, athlete who was so nice to, to give us, um, his name is pa- Paul Valencourt. So Paul was uh, nice enough to give us his equipment. Um, and um, and we then used that uh, for, for, for the record. The only problem was um, the, because I never touched the equipment before and it was different than mine, uh, we had to, you know, try to readjust it for my size. And there were, there were a lot of, you know, moving parts that, uh, that were uh, nerve wracking. But in the end, uh, it, it, it worked out and, and I was insanely um, happy. I think it's in. If you watch the game changes, you can actually see how happy I was because I'm literally like on the ground. I can't believe that. It- you say if I, you know, I'm a professor of kinesiology. Mm-hmm. At when I teach nutrition and dietetic science, that lecture, the homework assignment is to watch the game changers. That's it. And the next <laughs> class, we come back and we talk about it, and then we talk about the science of it. So that's brilliant. I make it as a part of my college curriculum. So. Just let's lay that up. Yeah, so so you you know what I mean when I say I was very happy afterwards. Very happy. But then, um, which then do you absolutely hate? Yeah, so again, the same thing. You are going to hate the the, the events where you're bad at. So when you have the taller guys, um, when it comes to something like the Atlas Stones, it's just great for them. Like, they have long arms, so they're going to just grab around the thing, hug it, and... Uh, Mostly, they're even able to close their hands in front of the stone, and then it becomes really easy to lift it. And for me, with my short arms here, um, I just basically have to somehow hold it on the sides. Um, but that's that's one problem. So, so I can't. <laughs> yeah, it, it would always be terrible for me to even grab it. And then the other problem is, um, and I mean, th- those guys. I, I was in in the last years. I was competing in the heavyweight category, so that that means. You know, um, someone like Brian Shaw, for instance, from the U.S., 
Um, he's two meters and 10 uh, centimeters tall. That's like, I don't know, like what, one feet uh, high, uh, uh, taller than I am. <laughs> so, so, um, and, and then he also weighs 200 kilos. So it's, um, for, I'm basically a dwarf uh, compared to that. So when when he lifts the stone, we'll just call that a mechanical disadvantage. Yeah, How about yeah, that? Yeah. So, so, <laughs> so when he lifts the stone for for him, it is just maybe in front of his belly, but for me, it's going to be in front of my chest. So I have to somehow, you know, even get it higher um, relatively. So Atlas Stone was probably the one I hate hated most, I guess. <laughs> now, when people look at you. Often the misconception is, well, how, how do you, how do you, how do you develop the size and the strength you need with a vegan diet? Mm -hmm. um, because when we talk about the concepts of catabolism and anabolism, you have to have the right marriage between the two, right? Breaking down the muscle catabolic mm -hmm. activity when you exercise and building it back up, yep. anabolism when you eat and when you sleep. But would you argue that not only your proper nutrition, but your nutrient timing was just as imperative to your your success? And can you tell us a little yeah. bit about that? Well, well, that's that's something that is uh, very you know strongly debated in, uh, in 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 the fitness world. Um, and I was always someone who believed in you know nutrition timing. So um, I cannot tell you if because. I have never tested it in a scientific way. So that means that, you know, I, I haven't done proper experimental settings where, where I would control all other um, 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 factors so that um, you, you would get um, viable results. But what I always felt like uh, the, the, the timing was important. So what I would do is I would always time uh, protein throughout the day. And when it, uh, I would always be pretty low in fats, um, and uh, and with the carbs, I would call, uh, I would time them in a way that uh, right before the training, I would try to get my blood sugar to be not too high, so that I control insulin, uh, with the idea that that then throughout the training you can have a, a, a boost in um, in growth hormone, which uh, then after the training. Um, I would then try to flood my system basically with um, with carbs, uh, and that would be a big smoothie or something with you know a lot of easily digestible carbs that go into the system quickly, um, to then get a spike in insulin, which exactly at that time is not a bad thing, but it's a bad thing in most of the times of the day. But at that time, because your body is basically um, de depleted um, and and uh, and it's stressed out from the training. It helps the uh, the body to you know to get the body into into the recovery zone as quickly as possible. So that was basically what I would do, and then I would also time minerals a little bit, like calcium and magnesium and, and, and stuff like that. But that's just like little that details. Well, I mean, everything has a synergistic effect. You can't absorb calcium into the bones with the absence of vitamin D. So the it, the science is there. It, the fascinating thing is that I think people don't realize that you can have a very high protein consumption without eating animals mm -hmm. or animal products. Yeah. Um, so what would be your main, what are your main go-tos? Um, are there any particular protein powders that you suggest mm. that people try? Yeah. So, um, I'm working with green force, uh, obviously. So, um, my, my protein powder that I use is, uh, is, uh, the one that green force is, um, so, so they don't only uh, have, uh, meat replacements, but they also, uh, have a protein powder. It's, um, pea based. Uh, but then other than that, I, o I also, um, actually consume a lot of soy products uh, because so so um, in, as a category uh, my my go-to category of, of nutrients um, or of food sources is just legumes in all their varieties so if it's you know chickpeas peas lentils all kinds of legumes uh, you know all kinds of beans and and everything um because they're high in pro high in protein and the protein is pretty decent in the in nutritional value um, and then I combine it with grains, which basically means that, you know, they, they complement each other. So and then also if, when you eat beans, you probably don't want to eat them just on their own. So so I always eat them with rice so that I have a combination with grains. 
Um, and Absolutely. And it's a combination of everything that makes everything a complete protein. You're getting yeah. all the essential amino acids at varying amounts. And, and honestly, the biggest misconception with soy is that it increases estrogen intake. But what we realize, even from the documentary, The Game Changers, it's not estrogen, it's phytoestrogen that we exactly. have in soy. And so it doesn't have that binding receptor um, quality that estrogen actually does that is found in animal products yeah. so yeah, like, meat, uh, uh, like um like dairy for instance you, you find actual estrogen in dairy i mean obviously it comes from the um uh you know f from the breast of a cow so it's not not a surprise that there will, will be hormones in it <laughs> <laughs> deductive reasoning and you actually were a long time vegetarian yeah. before you transitioned to veganism yeah. uh can you tell us like the difference that you felt mm -hmm. when you were training as a vegetarian versus as a vegan? Yeah, so it's, and why you made that shift? Yeah, it's interesting because uh, I training wise, I actually had a pretty significant boost after going from meat eating and um, omnivorous diet to a vegetarian diet for for around six months or so. I was really doing great, but then on the long run, I developed a whole slew of problems. Like for instance, um, I was uh, iron deficient constantly and then i would supplement iron uh, i would i would get iron supplements from from uh, my doctor and it, it wouldn't it wouldn't fix the problem um i never understood what it was until i went vegan and the iron deficiency just, just went away and then i realized that it was just the tons of dairy that i was consuming as um as a vegetarian it was inhibiting your iron intake yeah. right yeah so dairy does oh, that science exactly D dairy does that and um Coffee does it a little bit too, and uh, black tea as well. Uh, so you have to be a little bit careful with those things. But I'm drinking sometimes like tons of coffee nowadays, and I don't have any problem with iron deficiency. So I, I would say the dairy that I was consuming was probably much more potent in blocking the iron intake than uh, coffee or black tea are. But still, if you, for instance, uh, if you know that you have a meal with iron, it's probably a smart thing to um, around that meal to not drink any coffee or something like that so that your body can actually, you know, uh, get the iron from the food that uh, that you're eating or the supplement that you take or whatever. So um, so that was one problem. But then I, uh, I had a whole slew of other problems, too. So um, the one thing was that I was over acidized all the time as a vegetarian. So so I would have a heartburn like that was a constant thing for me. And the funny thing with the heartburn is that um, when I would drink milk, it would actually help, um, of course, because there's, you know, there's calcium in the milk. So the calcium is alkaline um, and that's going to help with, uh, with, with, the, um, with the acid that you have. Um, it's going to acutely, acutely help with the acid. But uh, what happens then is uh, when um, the protein gets digested, you with with any animal uh, source you always have lots of uh, sulfur containing amino acids which uh, when they get digested you get sulfuric acid as a byproduct so that was so i i always thought that drinking milk and having dairy would actually help with my heartburn what i didn't realize is that i was keeping it going um but it was just time released so that it would always feel good in the start and then later I would get the problems and I didn't, you know, connect the dots basically. So, uh, and, and that's something that I only learned after going vegan. And then all of a sudden for the first time in my life, I didn't have any problems with heartburn anymore. So I realized, okay, it was probably the dairy too. So yeah, I can absolutely. And, and that's something that uh, I try to really get into, you know, people's heads um, because a lot of people think, well, uh, going vegan sounds too extreme for me, but I, I would, you know, um, give this vegetarian thing a go. And I always tell people I did that for six years. Don't waste your time with it, because if when it comes to the health benefits, uh, veganism is way, way more potent than uh, than vegetarianism. So uh, and then obviously when, when, when you think about the um, uh, ethical uh, uh, implications, it's pretty clear. Um, I mean my reasons for going vegan were ethical so um so it's, you connected the dots there, there, as you say yeah and then there there is no question it's uh, when when you want to reduce uh, animal suffering there's no better way to do it than uh, with a with a vegan diet and a vegan lifestyle i mean it's just not just a diet it's more than that
Well, you can't go back. And I think that's the thing. Like you say, you have to connect the dots. And often we connect the dots because we want to see some sort of personal benefit. Mm -hmm. Oh, I, I'm finding myself chronically sore after my workouts. Uh, well, dairy is a natural inflammatory. Mm -hmm. It's going to persist that. And you're going to find recovery being harder, right? Plant-based diets reduce inflammation. They create a more robust endothelial lining. We, we see a better relationship metabolically with our cells. Mm -hmm. um, but then it's the mental aspect and your relationship with the world. And so I want to talk about that. You are what we term as the world's vegan strongman. How do you challenge the concept of toxic masculinity in your field mm. and your purpose in life to help animals? Yeah. Yeah. I think toxic masculinity is actually a very important part of um uh, of what what I always I mean even before knowing the term um, I always felt like uh, in 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 the culture of you know uh, the, the the fitness and and strength culture that that I was a part of I always felt like there was this kind of you know very primitive and 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 <laughs> and stupid uh, um, kind of notion that in order to be strong or to be perceived as strong you also have somehow to be you know reckless and don't give a damn about uh, you know what what happens with other people and and kind of be you know just just a dick i would say <laughs> so that's when i when i break it down to the to the main point it's just this this belief that you have to be a dick in order to to kind of be perceived as to be a man yeah to, an alpha or or whatever so uh, I always felt like that was really stupid. Like, <laughs> and I think that that probably has something to do that my upbringing was, you know, I had a lot of female influence in my up uh, in my upbringing. My my father died very early, so my main influence was my mom and my grandma. Um, so <laughs> that that kind of you know culture was very foreign to me. Um, but at the same time, I, I've always been someone who I am fascinated with the concept of you know, what I would call actual masculinity, which for me means, uh, you know, to, to be, a, you know, if you want to call it that, to be a real man, for me just means taking responsibility. That's what, what it really means. Because, um, you know, in society, for instance, we have a structural, um, it's, it, we have a structural disadvantage for, for women because, you know, I, I don't want to get into that because that's a rabbit, rabbit hole that, that is going to take, take hours to, to get into. But it is, it is clear that the, the power is still with the men in our society. So um, if you live in a system where the power is with the category that you are a part of, so uh, for instance, as, as humans, we are more powerful than animals. As men in our society, we kind of have more power than uh, in, in, in most contexts than women have. So for me, what that means is if you are part of that more powerful category, to do the right thing means to take responsibility and to care about those who are in the other category. So as a human being, I care about the animals. And as a man, I care about, you know, the injustice that, that women go through uh, in our society, especially, you know, having all that influence that I had in my upbringing, uh, that really helps me to see that, you know, to see the uh, disadvantage that women still have. And and I think it's a shame. And I think uh, as a man, it's just a moral uh, obligation to, you know, fight against that. How, however you do it, I mean, uh, everyone is going to find their own way. And it's not about, you know, I don't want to tell anyone how to live their lives. Uh, but at some, you have to find some way to, you know, to know that you, the responsibility that you have with the power that you have, that you are, you know, taking that serious and, and doing the right thing. That's, that's just how I feel. I think, I think you should go on like a middle school and high school tour <laughs> and like talk to kids in, in, in school. I'm not kidding. I think it, you have the power to really make an impact on young men who who can see things from a different perspective and and often that takes it takes a big man to do to do big things and i and i hope that that's something that we can see going for you in the future thank you uh, well um, we'll see when when the world goes back to normal hopefully um, you know next year or oh. i don't know as soon as possible i don't know if i'll ever go back to normal yeah um, um and i don't know if i ever want it to actually go back to normal mm -hmm. right but um 
it would be nice to have some normalcy where we can yeah. interact with people again yeah. without the concern of being sick, right? Yeah. And and frankly, if we really wanted a, a life without dealing with another novel coronavirus outbreak or a zoonotic br- outbreak, more people should go plant based. Exactly, because we're starting to see a lot of correlation and evidence between our animal agriculture and these these particular diseases. Yeah. But if we Let just, me not if we digress. just leave them alone, they're not going to give us all these diseases. <laughs> yeah. It's very plain and simple. <laughs> yeah. So let me, let me end up with this one. Uh, how has your life changed after being featured in the 2018 documentary, The Game Changers? Um, yeah. I mean, obviously, um, the, the, the film was very impactful. It, uh, it, I mean, it was, um, I could feel it in, in, in all uh, parts of my life. I, I mean, it was, it was visible in social media where for all of a sudden I was getting like tons and tons of uh, feedback from people who watched the documentary. Um, and then, um, yeah, I, I just felt it in, in, in all parts of my life. Um, but at the end, end of the day, it, it wasn't something that, you know, there, there was nothing that really surprised me. Um, I was expecting, you know, to, to get a lot of feedback and also have a huge backlash. And both of those things happened. I, I, I got a lot of love from people who found it um, inspiring. And then I got a lot of backlash from people who didn't like the message or who couldn't I would rather say who couldn't take the message because it was, you know, against something that they strongly believe in. Um, and I was expecting that and, and uh, it, it came that way. But um, I mean, for, for, for me, that's fine. Um, I, you know, I was expecting it. And, um, and also I think it's, it's part of the, it's part of why I feel what, what, what I do is, is challenging and is kind of fulfilling at the same time, because um you know, when, when you have this, um, when you feel the, uh, basically the, the, the pressure against you and, and you feel that some people just want, um, if they could, they would just try to silence you. Um, that just gives you so much more motivation to just continue doing what you do because you feel like, okay, it's, it's, uh, this is having an impact because if it wouldn't have an impact, they wouldn't be pissed. So if they're pissed, I'm doing something right. So uh, I don't know if, 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 if those people who, you know, try to basically work against veganism or try to work uh, against progress, if they actually realize that they're just motivating people to fight even harder because, because it's, it, it shows you that it works. That's right. So you, you see more positivity out of it then you do negativity. Even yeah. out of the negativity, you find something positive. So yeah, yeah, that's yeah. a nice, it's, that's a really nice twist. It's, it's always just the angle uh, that, that you, I mean, uh, I have this kind of, my problem is that I'm a, I'm a psychologist. So basically um, it's, it's kind of a, um, it, it comes with the territory that um, there, there are no negative things for me. I try to find something like, that I can grab that, um, that, that I can, turn even the negative things that happen into you know into something that i can work with and that i can use to you know just improve myself i think we could all learn from that and i hope that i can take a little bit of your vibe (laughs) and make it my own (laughs) but um patrick you you retired from strongman competitions in 2019 right and in uh in uh, 16 2016 after your tricep injury right exactly the, okay and so what's next for you <laughs> yeah so um, um i think in, in the last basically since the since the point where i went vegan um if i am my main motivation to do competitions and then everything that i was doing as an athlete wasn't really the competitions themselves anymore so beforehand i was you know i was a vegetarian but um that was just something that I was do uh, I would do for myself, and um, I didn't, you know, try to be an activist or outspoken or anything about it. It was just a private decision that I have made. Um, but when I went vegan, it was pretty clear um, before I went vegan that I was, you know, turning into an activist. I was turning into someone who was trying to use the sport as a platform for, you know, getting 
the message out that, that I wanted to get to people. Um, and, um, and so um, when I decided to go out of competitions and, and to, you know, um, not be an a- athlete anymore, I, I was thinking a lot about what will be the next platform that I'm going to use to, you know, do the same thing that I'm doing now. Because, you know, physically, it's just not possible to do strongman, you know, uh, until you're 80. But I still want to be an activist until I'm 80. So I was looking for a new platform. Um, and what, what I'm doing now and uh, what I'm trying to build up, basically, is that I'm trying to get more into the realm of uh, entertainment. Um, I was, you know, I've been basically... Um, 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 working on, on on trying to um, get a film idea that I had uh, a few years back um, going. Uh, I've, I've done a comic version of it in 2020. Um, and Earthraiser? Yeah, it's Earthraiser. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the idea... Yeah, is, tell, us a little, tell us about that. Yeah, the, the, the idea is very simple. It's um, we, we, we have a um, cultural uh, landscape uh, right now where superhero films are actually... Uh, specifically what Marvel does is, uh, you know, the greatest and, and, and biggest and most successful franchise of movies that, that has ever existed. Uh, and I was just thinking, man, if, if, if this is something that is, uh, you know, that, that, that the children and, and young people and also people in my age um, that they love and that, uh, you know, has an impact on them uh, emotionally, I was thinking that would be a great platform to do something where you... The idea was basically just to just have a superhero who fights for the animals. And then um, I just tried to, you know, come up with an idea that works. Um, and, and my idea was, what if the superhero feels everything that animals feel? Um, and that he, he just basically feels the suffering of every living being that is close to him. Um, and that that's going to automatically force him to fight for them because... Um, the idea was, if, if I have a superhero who is a vegan, I think that's going to kind of, you, you're going to see the same backlash that um, that I had after the game changes, because the non-vegans are going to say, ah, oh, look, it's just more propaganda or whatever. Okay. So the idea was, let's give them a hero who is actually like them. He's probably even a meat eater. And, you know, just, uh, in my story, he's a soldier. So he's a soldier. Um, and then he goes through this experiment where uh, he gets his superpowers, and um, and and the idea is uh, was, um, initially just um, I mean the story has also changed in the comic book. The idea is that he is meant to get uh, um, mind reading abilities, but now in the newer version it's a little bit more. I have injected a little bit more magic into it. So, so, but the initial version is he's trying to, you know, they're trying to make him be a mind reader, basically. But what happens is that he's not reading minds, but he's reading feelings. So, so he feels everything that uh, the the life around him feels. Um, and 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 in the start of the story, he is someone who the audience can connect with because he's not, you know, this strange vegan activist, whatever. But then his superpower forces him to become a warrior for the animals and for the environment. Um, and, and that's that's basically the core concept of the whole thing. Wow. Well, Patrick, look at you from bodybuilding to powerlifting to vegan strongman, but even bringing it all the way back to the beginning for your love for comics and sure. entertainment. And now you've brought it around full circle. Yeah. What? What a beautiful life you have created for yourself. Yeah, I, ju- I just hope that, and, that uh, this this thing with Earthraiser just works out because uh, then the the circle is going to be closed. And uh, yeah, it, it's and I I really see it kind of as my um as my legacy. I hope it's it's going to be successful. It's going to work out, and 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 a lot of people are going to see it. And then it, I think it's basically probably the last big thing that I'm going to do for the next hopefully for the next two decades, and then um, and then I can just rest. And, and and enjoy everything else in life. <laughs> well, that's fantastic, Patrick. And I, I can't thank you enough for sharing your stories with us and sharing your time with us today. And that wraps up this episode of V Kind Connects with the one and only Patrick Baboumian. And to watch this episode and many more, subscribe to us on YouTube on our V Kind Vibes channel. And to stay connected with us, follow us on Instagram and download the V Kind app today. 
On episode one of Vibes, we're taking you inside Bestie's Vegan Paradise, the 100% vegan marketplace in East Hollywood. There, we'll meet with co-founder and owner Asia Rain and learn more about the story behind Hollywood's favorite vegan grocery store. Our co-hosts, professor and television host Shabnam Islam and LA-based actor and writer Jill Galbraith, will face off in a cruelty-free contest inspired by Supermarket Sweep inside of Besties. Come join us for an exciting first episode of Vibes, the show that's busting vegan stereotypes one city at a time.